Hello, good evening and welcome to Movie News episode 20. This is our Film Club podcast. With me in the Movie News Towers tonight is Matthew Korn. Hello. And Gordon Sinclair. Hello. And I'm your erstwhile host for this Film Club podcast, and I'm Simon Boggy Burton. I was the one who had to choose the film for this podcast, and my choice is quite an older film, but one that you will see on TV every now and again, and it's made for TV thriller, but later a full-length theatrical release, is the 1971 film Jewel. And what's your name, sir? David Mann. How do you spell that, please? M-A-N-N, that's two N's. I'd like to report a truck driver that's been endangering my life. Joe Steven Spielberg cut his teeth and made his full-length directing debut. It stars Dennis Weaver, who portrays a terrified motorist driving a Plymouth Valiant, a typical square American car from the time, who is stalked upon a remote, lonely California Canyon roads by the mostly unseen driver of a tatty, sinister-looking 1955 Peterbilt 281 tanker truck. Well, the film is quite remarkable for its time because the antagonist, which is obviously the tanker truck driver, is never speaks. You never see him apart from in the cab occasionally from a distance, and it gives it more and more intrigue. Dennis Weaver was well known at the time, and it also starred Jacqueline Swap as his wife, and the lorry driver is a chap called Kerry Lofton, who was a stunt driver and also a truck driver in the past. The production of the film was overseen by ABC's director of movies, Lillian Gallo. The original made the television version, interestingly enough, was 74 minutes long. Because of its successful TV airing, Universal decided to release the film overseas in 1972. The TV movie wasn't long enough for theatrical release, so Universal had Spielberg spend two days filming several new scenes, turning Jewel into a 90-minute film. The new scenes were set on the railroad crossing, the school bus scene and the telephone booth. A longer opening sequence was added with the car backing out of a garage and driving through the city. Expletives were also added to make the film sound less like a television production. For the purposes of the podcast, all three of the Movie News team have watched the theatrical version with the extra scenes included. Right, let's go around the team and see what we thought of Jewel. Matthew, what were your thoughts? Jewel's a film I've watched many times. The first time I watched it, I recorded it off the TV when I was a kid, probably early 90s, and I've watched it a number of times since. I owned it on VHS back in the VHS days. I don't own it on DVD or Blu-ray, but I have watched it recently, recorded off the TV, and then again for the podcast. It's a simple film, but very effective, builds up slowly and has some really tense and exciting moments once it gets going, as it goes from simple road rage to something much more terrifying. Very little time, I think, is wasted on character development or dialogue. It is all about the battle between David Mann and his unseen adversary. I think the setting and cinematography are really good, as you can really feel the discomfort and desperation that Mann must be feeling stuck in his car on those hot and deserted highways. Towards the end of the film, you really start to feel quite hot and sweaty, just like he must be doing, because of all the scenes where there's lots of sunshine and dust and all that kind of stuff i think it's a really good film but my only criticism ironically is it's probably a little bit too long there's only so many times you can see the truck trying to ram the car off the road before it starts to get a bit tedious and i think it was probably better as the shorter tv version which i've never actually seen even so i'd probably rank it within my top five films directed by steven spielberg and it's still a good film to watch now i think yeah, I agree with that. I've never really seen the shorter version either. I like the bits that they've added, though, so I think that does make a difference. Gordon, what do you think of Jewel? Well, I think I'm probably the only one who did see the TV version then, because I saw that a long time ago and remember thinking it was a little bit dull. So I watched the theatrical version for the podcast and absolutely loved it. So I probably disagree that it's too long or that the TV version is better because I think some of the scenes that have been added are fantastic and I know we'll talk about scenes later. But I absolutely loved it because it straddles many genres. It's a stalker movie, a road movie, a western, a thriller. It also straddles distribution channels, TV and cinema. I think it's really forward thinking whether it was Spielberg or whether it was studios or whoever, to see that this film was a big success on the TV, so let's expand it. And it's not like films like District 9, which was a 10-minute short that then got a full feature film made of. This was a 78-minute film or something from the TV that they just added another 10 or 15 minutes to. And that seems really unusual to me and a masterstroke as far as I'm concerned. And maybe that was Spielberg because we know that him and Lucas are pretty good at making as much money out of the same piece of cinema over and over again so maybe it was him 
but it's hard to believe that it was actually his debut because it's a really assured film. There's some fantastic atmosphere creating shots. The sun and the scenery are used fantastically well. And the characters, although there's only a few, every one of them seems to actually have a real character. And one of the standout things for me is the absolutely brilliant opening scene. All it is is man driving his car across the country. And what he's done to show the distance and the boredom and all of that is just use the radio. He's just every now and again tuning the radio to a different channel or you hear it jump from one part of a conversation to a later part so you know time has gone on in between. And I think it's been used really well and that opening sequence is actually pretty long but it works. And when I was watching that opening scene I actually said aloud to myself I'm really going to enjoy this film because I could tell that that kind of filmmaking is what impresses me now. And I'm sure back when I watched it, when I was probably about 12 or 13, I didn't really care. But now I actually care about filmmaking and the style and that kind of stuff. I was really impressed. But if I have to be critical, I do think the end of the film is a huge anticlimax. You know, we never find out what's in the back of the truck. So what's in that tank could be milk. So when that truck goes over the edge, it crashes. Fair enough. But I like to think that it's full of gasoline and there's going to be a massive explosion. But this truck goes over the edge and nothing happens. It just kind of tumbles down a hill and stops. You've been waiting 90 minutes for this big conclusion. And it's cleverly done how he defeats the antagonist. But where's my explosion? Where's my excitement? Where's my big thrill at the end? So I was pretty disappointed with the very end. I think the ending is just a sign of the fact that it was a made-for-TV movie originally, so it's a little bit lacking in the sort of budget that you might get from a bigger film, I think. What you mentioned about the opening titles as well, I completely agree with, and from what Simon said, they did extend those for the cinematic version of it, but that's one of my favourite bits of the film, I think. It's just, like you say, the movement from civilization into the wilds where you could get accosted by a psychopath on the road. I think it's done very cleverly, like you say. Thanks, chaps. The thing about Julie's, it's one of the things I remember from when I was young. I remember when my dad and I sat and watched it, and I was quite young. And the fact that, you know, he starts out in the city and he just drives out. And then when he first passes the truck, even the minute I saw that truck, I was a bit scared of it. And it's a film that's stuck in my mind. I've never forgotten it from that day to this. And the thing I like about it is the unknown quantity of that truck and why it all started from nothing. It was just going to go past and that was it. It was just out of nothing. And then the guy just turned out to be a psychopath truck driver. And it's the cat and mouse story. And it is amazing how he defeats it at the end. I will agree that the ending is a bit lame. Yeah, it goes over the end. You expect to see at least a full-on mushroom cloud going over the top and the whole truck exploding. But maybe that's what you expected and they didn't give it to you. And it's just the way David Mann gets more and more stressed out about it. And he has a go at a guy in the cafe where he stops off and it's not the right guy. Things get to him and he then just resigns himself that I've got to beat this guy or I'm going to be killed here. I think the extra scenes help as well. And I think they add a lot to it. But it's just the fact it was just such an evil looking, the dirt on it and the sound of it. And the way it's in his mirror all the time, you can just see the front grill of it. It just looks evil, so it's just amazing how that affects me when I was young, and it's still, even now, I still get a bit of a shiver when I see it. So, yeah, I definitely agree with my weekly comments, and I just think overall it's a great film. And the canyon roads are just ideal for this kind of thing. It's just no one around for miles, no buildings, nothing, and it's just things can happen out there. I'm sure it does. I did say that I thought that it was perhaps a little bit too long, but I have to say most of the scenes that were added were actually worth adding. It's just that it's probably got one showdown too many between the car and the truck, I think. If it just was a little bit shorter, I think it would have benefited from it. Well, I suppose it is called Duel after all, but kind of drags it out a little bit too long for me. Okay, now we're going to go through our favourite scene, character and line. We'll start with scene, and I'll come to you, Matt. What scene stood out for you? Well, there's a couple, but to be honest, we've already talked about it. My favourite scene is the opening credits. I think it's just brilliant with the car driving through the city, gradually moving into less and less populated areas, with all the radio chatter in the background, like Gordon was saying. And it's actually over five minutes before any dialogue or action occurs. It's just the footage of this car driving along, but I just think it's brilliant and it sets the scene for the film perfectly. So yeah, opening titles is amazingly the best bit of the film, I think. You know, it's really funny because I thought nobody else would like the opening credits because I know I like slow films where people don't say much and you guys like more in-your-face stuff than I do. So I'm surprised and pleased to hear that that's your favourite scene. Was that your favourite scene as well? It isn't my favourite scene. So my favourite scene is one of the added scenes and it's probably, for me, the most exciting scene in the film. 
It's the snake around a petrol station scene. So man's trying to phone the police and the truck's parked up just further up the road. And it's a really well shot scene and looks really Western like as the truck looks on waiting for its moment to pounce. And then it slowly does a U-turn and then just hits the gas and drives straight at the phone booth where man stood there on the phone just saying, there's this truck driver trying to kill me. And it's obvious that the truck driver is not actually trying to kill him. He's just playing with him because once he gets close enough, he lets the air horn off so that he knows and he can get out of the way in time because the last thing he wants to do is kill him and spoil his fun. And he does, he jumps out of the way and the telephone box gets smashed to pieces. But that's not enough. The truck then just drives in big wide circles around the petrol station and keeps coming back and crashing through this really weird exotic animal display that's outside this petrol station. And it's like, do people really go into the middle of nowhere to see snakes and scorpions and things? The woman's there and she's really proud of all of the snakes and she's running out like, my snakes, my snakes and then a tarantula gets free and it's on man's leg and there's all sorts of creatures around and then at one point man picks up one of the containers that's probably still got a snake in it and throws it at the truck like that's going to do anything against a big steel truck and it's so believable the scene that it's really hard to think that you know there wasn't a couple of scorpions and tarantulas that got splattered as part of the film of that scene because it's really well done i just thought that was a fantastically exciting and fun scene yeah, that was a good scene. I found it strange as well. I didn't come into nowhere like that and she'd have all those kind of dangerous creatures just in cages and stuff. That's what it's like travelling across America. You know, it's like people go out of the way to see the world's biggest ball of string and all that kind of stuff. It's just weird roadside attractions all across rural America. Yeah. So it's actually believable in that sense. I kind of get it like that, but to me it seems like it's something that's put there to make you go to that petrol station rather than the next one. But if the next yeah, one's be, 70 yeah. miles away, you're only going to go to that one. You know, you <laughs> You go there because you need to, not because yeah, it's got true. snakes and scorpions in there. Yeah, and you can be damn sure there were real snakes and scorpions because there was no special effects scorpions and snakes back yeah. then, was there? Okay, thanks, chaps. The scene I like was one of the ones that have been added in for the theatrical release is the school bus scene. Dennis Reaver comes along, sees a school bus, stops, and then the guy says, oh, can you just give us a push and I can get moving? And he does it, and he gets caught up and they end up getting stuck together and eventually manages to break through. And next thing you see the truck comes up slowly and goes past as if to survey the scene and he's sort of looking at him and he's not shouting at the kids and getting all hysterical with them. But they get in and the truck, you see it through a tunnel in the hill. It's down there, just sitting there. And then it turns around and comes back. And that's when he starts losing it. He says, get in, get in. But the other piece about that scene is he gets away and all the truck does is come back and help them get the school bus running and actually does a nice thing. And you can see things through his mind thinking, well, what's going on? What's this about? This is really messing me around here. But then as soon as he gets down the road, it all kicks off again and he's straight back having a duel. And it's just a really clever twist on the scene there to see that the truck driver's all right and help them oh. out and then carried on with him. Yeah, I like that scene as well. That was probably my second favourite scene. I love the way that bouncing on the bonnet, trying to get it free. But I'm not sure he was being nice. I think that was just more playing with him. But I really like the line that's in that bit. We've said to the bus driver something along the lines of, that man's crazy or something like that. And the bus driver says, if you ask me, the only crazy one around here is you because he's ranting and raving. And like you say, the truck driver eventually just comes and helps and they've seen nothing else of what's going on. And I think that's one of the things I love about this film and about these kind of films is that only the person being persecuted knows they're being persecuted and everybody else around them is oblivious to it. Nobody knows what's going on and it's all in his head. And, you know, is it actually all in his head and he's actually not being terrorised because we don't know you know we're watching a film that could be all what he's seeing not what is actually happening so I really like that and that scene is really representative of that you can see it on the face he's almost disappointed that he's being nice and he's, no he's not he's not nice what's he doing and he, can tell exactly. it's just, his face he, he needs just... him to show how mad he is but he won't do it because he's yeah, playing exactly. with him even more it's a really good scene Okay, thanks, chaps. Obviously a film with very little dialogue. Have you got a favourite line out of one of the scenes? Gordon, what would stood out for you? There's not many, because like you say, there's not a lot of dialogue. But probably my favourite line is David Mann. It's quite early in the film and the camera slowly travels up the hood and you see him and he's looking weary and this long drive starting to get to him. It's before it's become this duel and I think he's letting the truck go and he just says, the highway's all yours, Jack. I'm not budging for at least an hour. Maybe the police will pull you by then. Maybe they won't. But at least you'll be far away from me. 
and it's like you couldn't be so wrong he just doesn't realize that that problem's only just beginning so i love that line because it kind of represents the start matthew what a line for you I actually really like the very first line of the film where David Mann pulls up behind the truck and all the smoke's billowing out of the truck. And obviously at this point you don't know exactly what's going to happen. He just goes, talk about pollution. And, you know, it just paints a picture of him straight away as being a bit of a moaner. And that's obviously carried through later in the film when he's getting aggressive with the people in the bar. And there's a bit where he has a conversation with his wife and his wife's on his back about something as well. And he's just this poor put upon guy who's about to have literally the worst day of his life. And that just sets the scene straight away. He's like he's stuck behind this truck and going, oh, this is horrible. Thanks, Matt. There is one line that I remember that's quite funny. It's not long after the bit when he comes up first behind the truck and he eventually gets past it. And the truck driver gives him a really long honk on the horn and a neighbor man looks in his rearview mirror at it and he just dryly goes, what was that? A greeting or a curse? And that's actually quite poignant to the mm. film. That turned out to be a curse, I think, right? <laughs> but it's just the way he says it. He says it sort of offhand and then he just drives off thinking nothing more of it. That's one bit where you're like, I know what that is, that's a curse, mate. And I like that, because that's when you know more than the character. There's another line that I like, that is probably a joke that's been said a million times in America, but because we don't call gas, is it ethanol or something like that? But he says to the guy in the petrol station, fill her up with ethyl, if ethyl doesn't mind. And I'm sure that joke is really old to people in America, but I, I found that quite funny. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, chat. You normally have a favourite character. Again, there's a few characters in there, but mostly only in it for a short period of time. It's basically based around Dennis Weaver's character and Kerry Lofton as the truck driver. So, gentlemen, let's start with you, Gordon. Who's a favourite character for you? Well, I'm going to go for an off-the-wall choice, and I'm going to go for the radio phone-in caller. I can't remember which part of the long drive that the radio phone-in's going on. The radio presenter is asking people for their special talents, and there's a guy that rings in, and I could have made this my favourite line as well, but this guy rings in and he says, well, uh, I play meat. And the presenter says, you play meat? Yeah, uh, meat, you know, beef, pork and stuff. And that's it. I have no idea what this whole conversation is about. It's just completely off the wall. This guy plays meat. I'm assuming he means he plays it like a musical instrument, but that's just an assumption because you don't know what, what he's talking about. It's just completely mad. So that radio phoning caller is my favourite character. <laughs> That is a left field choice. <laughs> I do like the radio phone-in. I assume they were all recorded specifically for the film, so yeah. they're quite amusing. Okay, thanks, Gordon. That's very different. wasn't really thinking about the radio phone-in people. Yeah, we don't see the character, but he's still a character in that film. I, I still enjoy him, and I'll look forward to hearing him every time I watch it from now on. Matt, which character do you find the most interesting? For me, my favourite character is the truck because you never see the driver so the fact there was a guy driving the truck's almost irrelevant it's actually the truck that's the enemy and it has a character and an attitude all of its own as you mentioned it's got this almost like a face and it's obviously blowing smoke and it's noisy and aggressive and ugly so it's basically a character within itself yeah i can see where you're coming from with that i'd agree with that as well it's just evil it personified in the truck form one thing that always got me about this film is that they show that there is a driver. You see him at the petrol station and that kind of thing. And that's needed, I suppose, for some of the other scenes, like the one in the diner where he accuses the wrong person of being the driver. But it almost makes me wish we'd never saw a driver. So we didn't know whether it was actually a possessed truck and the truck was just a demon and not a human playing with him. I don't know whether that would have ruined the film for me or made it better. But I think, obviously, 10 years later, Stephen King's starting to think that way and writes Christine. And I just wonder what kind of film we would have seen had the truck been an actual demon. We'll never know. Interesting observation. Mm. Although there is another Stephen King story, a short story called Trucks, which was made into a film called Maximum Overdrive, which has got possessed trucks besieging people oh. in a gas station or something. All right. Well, I'm not aware of that. Have you seen that film? I haven't seen the film. I've read the short story. The film is generally considered to be pretty shit, I think. Oh. <laughs> so probably not really worth watching. I might still try it anyway. Might be interesting. Or you could just read the short story. That's true. All right, that's really more our views about the film, Jordan. All we've got to do now is to actually give our rating for it. And I'll start with you, Matt. 
I'm going to go for four out of five stars. I think it's held up well. It's a good film. It's thrilling. It's interesting, well shot. And as I mentioned earlier, definitely one of my top five Steven Spielberg films. Okay, thank you very much. Gordon, what's your rating? I would also say it's definitely in the top five Steven Spielberg films, possibly top three. If that end scene had ended in real carnage, I probably would have been giving it a four and a half. But as it stands, I'm going to rate it four. Okay, I'm pretty much agree with both of you with what you said about the film. It's just one that obviously stuck with me quite a long time since I was quite young, and I've always liked the film anyway. The truck is the evilest thing on four, six, eight years, whatever it is, as I've ever seen. So I agree with you guys, I give it four stars out of five. And quite amazingly, because it's been a long, long time, we've actually got a new number one in our league table. An average of four stars puts Jewel at the top, just above Cop Car, that got an average rating of 3.9. And I think that's quite fitting because if you look at Cop Car, it's got some similarities to Jewel for sure mm. in the way it's shot in particular. The story is not really the same, but the cinematography, I think, is very similar. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think there's an absence of plot. You know, there's a theme and both have taken a theme and done it really well without having to put masses of plot twists in and developing characters massively. I think there are some good similarities. And Cop Car was one of my choices and I was always really pleased that that was at the top because I do think it's a fantastic film. But of all the films I've watched, there's only Jewel that I think comes close. So I'm quite pleased with Jewel at the top as well. Yeah, that was good. After we watched Jewel, Matt came up with a couple of films that are also based on a very similar premise with the lead of a truck terrorising people. The two films that we watched also is the 2001 American thriller Joyride. Go, go, go. Joyride is faster and more furious than the competition. Who is the pretty girl? Watching us! Paul Walker takes a wilder ride here than he did in The Fast and the Furious. Ah! It's a first-rate pure thriller. Come on! Get into the driver's seat and choose from four alternate endings. The best thing about a joyride is not knowing how it's going to end. Don't open the door! Joyride. Directed by John Donovan, by J.J. Abrams and Clay Tarver. It stars Steve Zahn, Paul Walker and Lily Sobieski. And the film follows three friends going out for a ride on the highway and eventually coming into a terrifying conflict with a mysterious yet murderous truck driver. The other film we watched was Wrecker, the 2015 Canadian horror film written and directed by Michael Buffaro. It stars Anna Hutchinson and Drea Whitburn as friends on a road trip who are menaced by a psychopathic tow truck driver. So let's talk about Joyride. What were your thoughts on that, Matt? I'm quite a fan of this film, actually. It's a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. I know it's not an amazing film, but myself and the wife have watched it several times and have always enjoyed it. It obviously takes the premise of Duel, of a truck chasing some people, but it mixes it with The Hitcher as well, which is another film from the 80s that I'm quite a big fan of. So the guy driving the truck is more of a character in this than the truck is. The truck is a weapon, but he's a killer in his own right, really. It's got its own moments of originality and some good humour as well, I think. It starts off really good and builds lots of creepy tension. The bit in the hotel room in particular where they've tempted the driver of the truck to visit some guy next door to them in the hotel is a really good scene where something's happened but they're not quite sure what and they don't find out until the following morning. But the film does lose its way a bit towards the end and comes a bit generic. You may not know this but the DVD version which we got at home has four different endings so it's obvious they couldn't quite decide how to end it so they shot a lot of different endings and none of them are particularly outstanding so that's probably where it falls down the most but overall i still think it's a decent film and i'd give it three and a half stars okay thanks matt gordon what's your take on joyride there's not really much more i can add to what matt said i watched it i relatively enjoyed it but i can't remember that much about it I remember that they've fooled some trucker with a CB into thinking one of them's a woman, which I thought was quite a pathetic kind of setup to the film, to be honest. Is it Paul Walker who's doing the girl's voice? And I really think that that's terrible. And, you know, even on the distortion on a CB radio, no one's going to believe he's actually a woman. So I think the setup is quite poor. The film itself then becomes quite interesting, quite exciting. Personally, I'd have liked more horror and less comedy. I don't think the balance was right for me. I'd rather it was a horror or a comedy. So maybe a little too much comedy, maybe not enough gore. But, you know, it was a film that I don't regret watching. I believe there are two or three sequels to it. I don't think I'll be rushing out to see any of those. And I'll give Joyride two and a half stars. Yeah, I don't think I'll be bothering with the sequels either. I'm sure they're all terrible. Director video rubbish. 
Dance Champs. I quite like Joyrides. It's not quite as linked in with Jewel as Wrecker is, but the fact that they antagonise this guy on the airwaves and cause a lot of their own problems by being silly about it on the CB, which I'm sure people do in America when they've got CB and radio, so it's just like the internet, you can just hide behind the radio while to this time, it didn't work for them. But I quite liked it. The tension was there. I did like the scene when the other truck driver chased them because they left their wallet behind and they thought it was him. Yeah. And then he gets in his truck and then he does a three-point turn. And next minute, the bad truck just smashes straight through the middle of the back truck, literally smashes it in half and comes straight at them. And I jumped. I was like, oh, my God. That was a particularly good scene. I did actually sort of always let a bit of wee out there. I just didn't expect I- that truck to split in bits and that one come through it. I'd forgotten about that scene and I did really like that scene. I thought it was going to be really boring and generic as it was building. Like you say, he gives his wallet back and that's great. That wasn't that unpredictable, but it was when the real truck turns up that was really good. But it's also interesting. I hadn't thought of it, like you've just said, about the, you know, you've got internet warriors who wind people up and it's just the same as what they were doing on the CB. You know, we've got people doing it on the internet now and then ending up getting hunted down. You know, there's been stuff in the press about trolls who've got their comeuppance and I hadn't thought of the parallels there. Yeah, things like that just don't take the piss because it can come back and bite you on the ass. But yeah, it was a bit crazy when the police came to rescue him and the truck driver still was going for it and smashing through the whole back of the motel. I thought the scene in the cornfield was a bit generic again. They could easily run off into directions they wouldn't be able to catch them. But they still stuck to certain places where the truck could still get to them. Like, you know, run completely the other way and you won't get caught. <laughs> but then it's not a film if you do it sensibly. Do you? But yeah, overall I thought it was really good. So I'm going to give it three and a half out of five. Okay, so that gives a movie muse recommendation of 3.2 for Joyride, which, to be honest, I'm surprised it's come out that high. But there we go. Right, moving on, because <laughs> we have to, I suppose. <laughs> moving on to Wrecker. Gordon, what was your take on this? This is another one that I can't remember too much of, other than I just hated it. I do remember almost immediately deciding I was going to hate it. I'd read that it was almost a scene-by-scene remake of Duel. So knowing that and going in and watching it and then immediately seeing that there are two people in the car just destroyed it for me within the opening five minutes. Two people in the car just takes the whole dynamic of this one man against one truck who's got nobody who can help him. And like I said earlier in Jewel, he's the only one who can see the terror that he's being forced to endure. But as soon as you put two people in the car, that dynamic completely changes. So I lost interest in the film immediately. But I suppose, to be fair, the two girls in the car had less brain cells than David Mann in Jewel anyway. So it's not like they were in a better situation. There was one bit in the film that I know other people have said was so obvious. And Matt, I was talking to your wife about it, and she said that it was one of the most obvious bits in the film and it was terrible. But I actually quite liked when she finds a friend in the boot of the car. And I think it's probably because I turn my brain off because I don't like knowing what the twist is. So I think I don't try to work out what's going on. So that bit is the only bit I enjoyed in the film. One other thing that stood out is how souped up their car was and they couldn't outrun the truck. And there are points where they're driving like race drivers, but then when they need to, you know, they're keeping to the speed limit. I just didn't understand the film. It was that bad that almost all of it just went by without me even knowing, caring, remembering. It was absolutely a horrible film. So I'm going to rate that film as one star, and I feel a little bit dirty giving them that much. But they were two nice ladies, so I'll give them one. (laughs) Excellent. Thanks, G. Matt, what's your take on this? Oh, pretty similar. I mean, it was just a terrible rip-off of Jewel, wasn't it? I mean, the two women, they may have looked nice, but they were just horrendous. I'm not really a fan of violence against women, but I wanted the truck driver to catch them and kill them. It made absolutely no sense, as you said, Gordon, because their car is so much more powerful than the truck. They could have just left it in the dust at any point in the film. It's not even like a big tanker truck either. It's just like a tow truck. So the fact that they can't get away from it is ridiculous. And it rehashes almost all the main scenes from Jewel, but worse. I mean, how could they take such a good film and rip it off completely and make it so bad? It just doesn't make any sense. 
that line I said that was my favourite line from Jewel, the talk about pollution, the first line in this film is talk about climate change or something like that. You know, be inspired by it, but just to make such a blatant rip-off was just horrendous. Every major scene, apart from the school bus scene, actually, I don't think that made it in, but she had the showdown with the guy in the bar and all that kind of stuff. The camera work's really bad as well. I mean, there's loads of slowed down tracking shots and I'm sure the car was travelling along the same bit of road over and over again as well. And the special effects at the end of the truck going over the side <laughs> of a cliff, it was CGI, I think. Yeah. And it would have been better if they'd literally got, you know, a Tonka truck and set it on fire and pushed it down a little hill because they were worse than the original despite it being made over 40 years later. There was virtually no redeeming qualities to it really. So yeah, one and a half stars from me and I'm not really sure why I'm giving it the extra half. The two biggest things I don't understand are one, they used a tow truck when the truck was the important thing in Jewel. It was the most important thing and it was the biggest character. And the second one is why they didn't just call it Jewel and call it a remake? Why pretend that it's a new film and that it's something different? They might have had to pay somebody to use the name Jewel. Well, I'm sure they had to pay somebody to <laughs> copy all of the scenes. The worst bit of it was, well, all of it really, but <laughs> something I've just thought of. Right at the end, there was a hint that the truck driver wasn't dead. And he's just like, why are you even suggesting that you might make a sequel <laughs> yeah, to this? Make a sequel, yeah, because there is. What did you think, Si? <laughs> yeah, I agree with everything you said. I'll just do it in a quick roundup because you said most things I was going to say. Why they've got a brand new Ford Mustang that can do about 150 miles an hour and they couldn't outrun a truck. I just found that ridiculous. The Mustang, the potential was there to smash it all up. But throughout the whole film, Ford must have told them you can't smash our car up because there was no real damage on it. Even after driving through bushes and rocks and banging off a few things, a couple of times it hit the truck and I couldn't find any damage on it. On it apart from it's slightly dusty at the end of the film and i didn't agree with it pushing the truck over the cliff the power of the engine of the truck would probably overpower the car so i don't know how she managed to push it off with a car that just didn't seem to make sense to me and the bit of the truck going off the cliff again, like you say, it was like a toy truck falling down a piece of cardboard. <laughs> if you watch it again, when the truck first stops on the edge of the cliff, look in the background, there's all scenery, like farms and stuff. The next time, it's all gone. It's a completely different background before it tips over. The only one interesting fact for the whole film for me is at the very end, when someone pulls up into that yard, all the cars are there are the ones that they pass and the truck pass in the film. So obviously the truck got them at some point. I don't know how he's still chasing the other but he did disappear for a while and all the cars in that junkyard are the ones that were passed on the way the guy with the trailer the other people all the different cars including the one that he was towing at the start which was someone yeah, else's I did car. notice that it's just that's a little bit sinister I think yeah. that sort of quite a sinister ending it is except that's what I mean about setting up for a sequel that no one's ever going to pay to be made so it added nothing to the See, film at all I didn't realise that that was the same cars and I wondered why it was lingering on some of them too long and obviously that's the reason is because it was trying to make you think oh yeah they passed that one earlier but what got me was they had a perfect opportunity at the end of the film to put some drama and some pathos and something into the film the truck's teetering and she ends up just pushing it off what i was hoping for at that end was that she was going to back up and then she was going to drive at high speed and she was going to sacrifice herself to kill the truck driver and then there'd be some big end to it that meant something and you know had a bit of heart but they didn't it was this little blonde girl saves the day and off we go the whole film was showing you how completely stupid these two girls were and how clever this truck driver was to keep outwitting them. But then it just fizzled out at the end and that ending, my ending, just would have added something to it and maybe it would have got one and a half stars from me. We all could have made a better <laughs> rip-off of Jewel than that film, easily. Let's talk no more about it, eh? Anyway, my rating was one and a half stars too, for the record. Okay, so that gives us a rating of 1.2 which is certainly not a recommendation. I actually think that's our lowest ever combined review score that we've done. Absolutely. We're in complete agreement. It was complete shite. Okay, thanks, chaps. That wraps up Jewel and the other two films, one Joyride and the other uh, whatever. And <laughs> I'm going to now hand over to Matt for the next film club choice. 
Thank you, Simon. My film club choice is a bit of a strange one. It's the never officially released 1994 adaptation of the famous Marvel super team, The Fantastic Four, produced by Roger Corman and directed by Ole Sasson. And the reason I've chosen this is because I watched a documentary a couple of months ago on Amazon Prime called Doomed, The Untold Story of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four, which was really interesting. It tells the story of how this low-budget Fantastic Four movie was made and then canned during post-production and was probably never intended to be released in the first place in fact but of course bootleg copies of the film did eventually surface and that's what you can see on YouTube and various other places what got me watching the documentary was the passion of the cast and crew and it made me want to see the film even if it was just out of pity for them really so I really recommend watching the documentary first because I think it'll probably make you appreciate the film more and then we can see if it is as terrible as history suggests and also how it compares to the big budget Fantastic Four films released years later as i mentioned it's available on youtube the quality is not going to be great because it's never been remastered or anything like that but it should be an interesting experience i think okay thanks matt sounds interesting that's it for the film club podcast for this time for the movie news team of course you can keep up to date with all our movie musings on the movie news website which is www.movienews.net and of course our facebook group and twitter feed so from all of us here at movie news towers it's good night (laughs) 